waiting, and we are live. Um, it's still not showing any viewers, although I see a whole bunch of people talking to us in the chat. So uh -huh. I'm waiting for something to indicate that we have humans out there watching, either in the Do chat. Do they see us? I'm not sure. Um, this is always the scary part of the show, where we're not sure how much of a delay there is between things going out on YouTube. And, um, okay, I can see that we have two viewers, so people are clearly starting to get our feed. Okay, this is exciting. Five viewers, okay. So I'm going to take this moment before we get started to just say hi to everyone. Uh, Guido Bibra is saying, we see you. Jim Meeker, you are live. So hello, Guido, Jim, Thomas, Matt, uh, Andre, Munoz, Eli, Jim, uh, I'm sure I'm missing people, scrolling, wow. scrolling, scrolling, uh, Michael, uh, Nancy, <laughs> Metamine, B. Salama, who is a new person, um, Phil Wilcox, uh, Giselle, I don't know how to say your last name, so I'm just going to say Giselle. Um, Hello everyone out there and thank you so much for joining us on what is to many of you and to all of us, um, well except Larry, a very, very snowy Wednesday afternoon. Uh, Larry, our guest today, Larry Lebowski from the Planetary Science Institute is coming to us from Arizona. So let me go ahead and give the show an actual official start because I think I forgot to do that which will make editing difficult. Hello everyone and welcome to this week's edition of Learning Space. This is a, a show that comes together one or two times a month and we're hoping to increase frequency over time. And with each of our episodes we focus on a different way that you can get kids in your life or other people's kids that you beg, borrow, or steal uh, engaged in learning and doing science activities. Uh, this week I have with me my co-host Georgia Bracey and we Hello. have joining us special guest Larry Lebowski who's from the Planetary Science Institute down in Tucson, Arizona. Welcome Larry. Thank you. Hi Larry. Hello everybody out there. This is my first time doing this so we'll see how it goes. Hey, we're we're a friendly bunch. A friendly <laughs> bunch, okay. All right. So to those of you who are out there watching us live, you can participate through, with us through the chat dialog on YouTube. And this is a kind of new way that we're doing this. This is the first time we haven't used the Google Hangouts on Air interface. We're instead using the YouTube Live Hangouts on Air interface, which is strangely just a little bit different. Uh, so let us know if there are any problems and feel free to interrupt us with questions. Um, and I would like to say this show is sponsored entirely by you. Uh, people like you are donating, becoming our patrons through patreon.com and we are really grateful for what you're doing and we have scheduled this Friday a patrons only fireside chat. It's going to be at 4 p.m. Central Time which is 5 p.m. in New York and 2 p.m. in Los Angeles and 11 p.m. if I can math uh, in, um, no sorry, 10 p.m. in London. Um, so please uh, donate and join us for a fireside conversation which there will actually be no fire but um, you, know, you know the drill. Um, so this week uh, we are here to talk about science fair. If you are a parent of a science fair child or you are a scientist that lives too close to a regional science fair location, you know that it is almost time for the regional science fair competitions in which we get to select as judges and you may be getting tapped to be a judge. Uh, which kids we're sending to the nationals and along the way we get to see all of the amazing th things that kids are doing. Georgia and I help out every year with our local fair um, mm -hmm. but Larry has been doing this mm -hmm. in the biggest, I think it's the biggest at least, regional science fair in the US and I'd love it if you could introduce our audience to what SARSAF is and what you guys have been engaged in down there in Arizona. Okay, I'm, uh... If you, you want me to start out with just, expl I'll explain what SARCEF is. SARCEF is um, Southern Arizona Regional 
science and engineering fair. Yes, I can always <laughs> never never acronyms always get to me, and basically it's uh, it's celebrated its 60th year, and yeah. some of the slides I have show exactly what's going on. But basically, we do more than just science fair, or actually the organization does more than science fair. I'm just on a board member and hang around and help them out. But basically, mostly what they do is a science fair, which is next week, has about. 1900 or 2000 science fair projects and as a for professional de professional development the organization now reaches about 35,000 kids in southern Arizona and there are about 75,000 science fair projects that are being done in public schools private private schools etc home schools so it's a funneling project that's you know huge Though it could be bigger because there are a lot of schools that just don't do it. So part of what I'm hoping to do over the next few years is get locally and nationally more kids doing research projects that can become science fair projects. And thanks to NASA, they're supposed to be Earth and space sciences. So I'm not supposed to, well, I guess I could do biology if it's related to exobiology and stuff like that. But primarily, NASA is looking for. How do we get more kids involved, engaged in that? Because it's interesting, out of the almost 2,000 projects that were submitted or viewed last year here in Tucson in the regional, only I think 15 of them at all grade levels were earth and space science related. So it's a small number. And I, have, I think it has a lot to do with you can't go to Mars and do a science fair project, a research project on Mars. Probably has something to do with it. Or it's difficult to build your own spacecraft and study a planet. And the science fair projects that we're seeing are all over the map in terms of what kids are accomplishing. Um, I, I know I, growing up, got to know science fair not as a participant, but from seeing it on TV, and it seemed like it was always just like volcano of stuff coming out the top of it. Um, but when we actually go to science fair, there are still a number of projects that are largely baking soda and vinegar or making batteries out of new vegetables. Um, but there are kids out there that are working on new ways to test for cancer, are working to develop new wing designs for gliders. What are some of the most amazing projects that you've seen so far? You're supposed to ask me this question in advance so I can give you an answer. <laughs> Sorry. I, the, the prob my problem is, is that I, I don't get to see all of the projects. I spend a day viewing projects, and most of them are at the elementary and middle school level. And then the high school ones, I get to do prim pr primarily the earth and space sciences ones. So I personally have not seen any a lot of them that I would say, wow, blow me away, unfortunately. I just don't get a chance to do that. So I have to beg off on a response no, to that it's, question. It's completely fine. And this actually brings up um, some of the, the funding that you mentioned at the beginning of this, this show. We, with, with this show, Learning Space, it is not funded by NASA. Uh, this is, as I said, funded strictly through Patreon donations. But we are all three engaged in uh, a NASA um, federal grant. And one of the things that we're funded to do is improve what we're seeing in science fairs. And this is largely work that Larry is going to be doing. And part of our goal is to get kids not thinking, well, I can't go to Mars and plant potatoes like Mark Watney, so uh, let's instead uh, just do what you look up in a book. We're trying to actually get kids realizing, hey, there's different things we have on Earth where we can simulate environments, where we can download data, where we can do all these different things. And you're the one who's going to be going out and helping teachers understand what it is that the possibilities are. Can you talk a little bit about that? I, I, I think part of the issue I have even now with the way science fairs are done is that, and 
the international science fair is getting away from it. The idea that basically I come up with a hypothesis and then I prove the hypothesis or not, yes, no, end of story. That's not really how science is done. My training is as a scientist, and if you go back and look at all the things I've done in my career, what really happens is that you make an observation, and you sort of go, I wonder, and then you go try to answer that question. So if you make a, an observation, you then go, you know, how do I go about answering that? I, the one I like to use is that, you know, why is the sky blue? And then you go try to figure out why the sky is blue. But you can't ask that question unless you've actually looked up at the sky and said, oh, look, the sky is blue. Why is it blue? So in that respect, there's, I think there needs to be a, a philosophical change in the way, at least at elementary and middle school, the way science fairs are being done. I haven't broached this subject with a local organization yet, but we'll see how it works. Because the whole idea is that basically, if you look at the way an average scientist does research, you have something that you you look at and you wonder, gee, what's going on there? Um, and then you decide, well, here's my idea as to what's going on, how do I test this? And then you go do your science fair project, which could be building a spacecraft to go to Mars or something like that. And when you get there and you do your observations, if you're lucky, you answer some of your questions. You go, yeah, I was right. But it turns out that in many respects, the more exciting things are when you find the things that you go, that's not what I expected. Something's really different than what I expected. And we're finding this in all the, re the projects that are going on now, going to Pluto, going to Vest and Ceres, going to a comet all of those things, there are more questions coming up than there are answers. Uh, I think it was Isaac Asimov that says the most exciting thing is not Eureka, it's, that's curious, I think is the correct <laughs> term. But it's, it's sort of, it's, it, you raise qu more questions than you have, than you've answered, and that opens up new fields of study. It happens all the time. Because it turns out, guess what, we're not always right. Mm -hmm. Our hypothesis, our ideas, our theories are not always correct. So it sounds like science fairs are moving to be more authentic, really, to uh, to better sort of parallel what real science is actually like. At least at the high school level, I think that is happening with kids who have the experience. It's how do you, which is what we want to do, is how do you provide the teachers with enough background information, enough experience on their own, so that they can actually work with their kids to get them curious about something, to observe something and say, I'm curious about this, I'm going to go investigate this as opposed to, why do boys drive red cars? Oh, because girls like red cars, which is a science fair project I have seen. That's up there with building volcanoes. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, I think the important thing is to, to get across to the kids is that your, your, the final the final answer may not be a yes or a no. It may be uh, maybe yes, maybe no, or gee, there's other things I could be doing to really answer my question. Nice. And how is engineering then playing into this now? Because a lot of even our own fair here at Southern Illinois University has sort of changed its name. It's now the Science and Engineering Fair or Challenge. Yes. <laughs> we have a different acronym. So how is how is that um, looking and changing what the fair is like? In the acronym SARSF, it's science and engineering. So there is a category of engineering design. How do you design something that will investigate a certain topic? And, you know, it doesn't need to be, you know, building a working robot. It could be just designing something that actually aligns with the science that you're trying to investigate. So it may be at the elementary and middle school, one of the things that we're looking at doing as far as part of the NASA program is giving the teachers a little bit of science background knowledge. Let's go study, you know, let's talk about the solar system. What's all the stuff out there? Planets, asteroids, dwarf planets, comets, etc. Go have your kids build something out of stuff. So, so we have a question coming in from Jake 
Hoift. I, I think I might have gotten that vaguely correct, and I'm sorry, Jeff, if I totally mispronounced your name. Um, and he's asking, any suggestions for the very young? I have a three and four year old. How how do you get kids started off thinking scientifically? Okay, why do we get these hard questions to begin with? <laughs> three and f I mean, very few science fairs actually are even do elementary school let alone three and four year olds but three and four year olds are curious and I mean, you may not be able to do an astronomy related thing but you, you never know Th some three and four year olds are smart you can go out and look at shadows you can look at the moon moving through the sky you can do all sorts of things like that um, if you you if you can help them and you don't you know you won't necessarily well three years or four years old you're not going to get a science fair project out of it you know project the sun onto something and see that there's stuff on the sun that's you know little dark spots that are moving around over time there's all sorts of things one of the big things in the next generation science standards is patterns and there's a lot of stuff in astronomy that's patterns um, my wife used to do a lot of myths and legends of the night sky and all of those are talking about constellations, asterisms, you know, star patterns and looking at the patterns up in the sky because that's how that's how science started is looking at the patterns not having a clue why the stars were moving across the sky or appeared to move across the sky or why there were these other things that moved relative to the planets but they came up with you know myths and legends that sort of explained that they probably realized that they were not correct but those patterns actually helped them understand what was going on to the point of oh I know when to plant my crops I know if it's going to be a rainy season or a dry season all sorts of things like that morals etc so as far as the a kid that's three or four years old you might go out and tell them a story there are lots of books out there that explain what those patterns are up in the sky and they can start looking at those patterns and maybe they'll start asking questions of why are these patterns from day to day or over a night different and what are those objects up there that are moving if you have a telescope you know look at Jupiter or Saturn's and, rings. And what's really cool with this age is you can do things because they don't have the biases that adults have yet. You can do things like lay out a bunch of pictures of all of the planets that aren't to scale because that's untractable but have things vaguely at, at all the rocky worlds are smaller than all the gassy worlds all the icy bodies are itty bitty. Um, ask them to sort things and just by looking at them they can start to sort things. This is why little kids do leaf collections. You learn all the maple trees look like your hand and all of the oak leaves are long and prongy. Um, these are strangely lifelong skills. I still remember my leaves because of first grade. Um, and you can start getting them thinking in terms of these patterns. There's a book by H.A. Ray, the author of Curious George, who did his own book on constellations. And these are ways to get your itty bitty little kids involved. Now, I, I see people in the chat talking about getting involved in judging. And since we are going into regional science fair, what would you say to the person who's never seen a science fair and maybe wants to get involved next year, but probably should check out things this year. I, I, th I think it's not a bad idea just to see if you can get invited to go. At this point in time, it may be a little late to be an official judge, but I mean most places you have to have you know, a, a high school degree in order to do a science fair project and that, uh, to, do a, to be a judge at a science fair. And it doesn't really take all that much. I think the most daunting thing is if they give you a table of you know here's a score of one to ten most of us basically sort of go through all the projects and say hey this looks good this you know this looks nice let's call out the twenty percent or thirty percent that are, are good looking and then decide which are the best and usually whenever you do a science fair there's usually two or three other people who have some skills that have done it for years, the teachers, whatever it might be, who are very willing to help you go through it your first time. 
and, so and I, I, w I would not be scared off by it. No, in, in fact, we often uh, go to our local Scott Air Force Base and ask the uh, men and women in service to come help us judge science fair. Our local science fair gets a lot of monetary awards from various branches of the military, and it's kind of cool having them there in such a positive aspect. Um, so, so Nancy's saying, as a judge, are you permitted to quiz the students on their projects to judge their knowledge of what they've presented? Um, and I'm, I'm going to add, this is something that's particularly relevant when you come face to face with that kid whose project looks like somebody's doctoral dissertation. How, how do you handle this? In, at the, um, say at elementary and middle school, they tend to be just, you, you just go do the pro, you just evaluate the project, you don't tend to have the kids there. Sometimes you do, and it, it, it probably varies from school to school and from regional to regional. For the regional here, basically the middle school students are encouraged to come in and the judges are encouraged to talk to the kids. At the high school level, it's required that you do that. So you can talk to the kids, critique them, find out what they were thinking. Oh, why did you do these axes, axes this way? You know. You know what got you curious about the, doing this project? Where do you, pl you know, now that you've done this project, where do you plan on going with it, if any place? So yes, you can do that. It, but again, I suspect it depends a lot on the on the school that you're working with, and or with the regional fair you're working with. So that's one of the things I'm hoping to learn more as the years go on. So is what do other places do? And you work a lot with teachers, you said. Um, are there a few things you could say that you find that teachers, you know, are hesitant about um, or have trouble with um, when they're doing science fairs um, or even in the classroom or something you would suggest to a teacher who's kind of thinking about it but isn't quite sure? Okay, there is, I did a poster so actually, it was originally something for a proposal we did, but more recently I did it as a poster. It's called Everyone Teaches, Everyone Learns. And I've got pieces of it uh, that can be shown. Uh, but basically, I think the important thing to realize if you're getting involved is that everybody can, and, and all of these things are, are but basically the idea is that when I started doing this with my wife 27 years ago, I was a scientist. She had uh, an education background. And basically what ended up happening is we, we were smart enough to realize we didn't have a clue what it was like working with teachers or elementary school or middle school kids. So the idea of we, we did something that nobody had done before. We actually talked to teachers and asked them, Help us. Tell us what you want to do. What? what sorry. What we? What you would want us to do? All of the teachers who we work, were working with 25 years ago that we're still working with today. And so, for example, say for example, the what we're starting to do is we've already got a group of teachers. What can we do to help you? And the answer is a little bit more science background and give us some ideas of what we can do even if it's not things that would be directly science projects, you know, uh, science fair projects coming out of it. But, you know, give us an example. So the example work that we've come up with is something that my wife and I and one of our teachers developed 20 years ago, something like that, which is building a Mars rover. There's a person who saw his kids do this and has actually got money from NASA to do a, a major program nationally with a Mars rover. But our idea is to basically say, there's lots of stuff out there. Could you build something out of junk, you know, leftover stuff, you know, straws, wine cork bottles, you know, the corks and out of a wine bottles, whatever it is, <laughs> and build something. The advantage of this is, is the kids have ownership. I built this thing from stuff that I brought from home.
and it's really powerful. It's amazing and, how many toilet paper tubes you get. <laughs> and and while science hasn't changed in the last 20 years, and for better or worse, what teachers need hasn't really changed in the past 20 years, um, although we're getting better at fulfilling their needs. Um, one thing that has changed is the opportunities available to kids. Uh, it used to be that you had to be attending a school that participated in science fair and one of the reasons I never participated in science fair is I never went to a school that participated in science fair. But now we're starting to see that companies like Google are sponsoring their own science fairs online. How do you think this is going to change things? I, I am still open to trying to understand what Google is doing. Google is doing something at the high school level, maybe eighth grade. How the heck do you start out with at younger ages? And I'm not that, that may be something that we should be thinking about doing with our project. You know, Google is great, it but it is high school level. It's an internet it's an international program. What can we be doing for elementary school kids, for middle school kids, for elementary and middle school teachers. Because trust me, a lot of good elementary school teachers don't have any clue where to start with this. And I think that is the biggest fear they have is that I don't even know where to start. Because my science background was 20 years ago or 15 years ago in, as a freshman or sophomore in college. I haven't taken any science since then. Where do I go? What can I do? And I think one of the things we could do, and this is just off the top of my head, is that there's a lot of stuff that NASA is doing right now, missions to other planets. How do we help the teachers help their students to actually understand what the scientists are doing and also get the these people, the teachers and the kids, to realize that the scientists, they may be smarter, they may have their PhDs, but the, in some cases they're going, oh, wow, this is exciting, as much as the kids are. And and that's and, okay. Yeah. And, and part of what we're going to be doing uh, as we work to add new features and new forums to CosmoQuest is creating spaces where teachers can go to join communities where they can get help from their peers and get help from us as scientists in how to maneuver this, this changing landscape. And uh, Nancy Graziano is asking an excellent question that I'm not even sure we have an answer to yet. And I'll that's try. what impact has new technologies had on science fairs like 3D printing? Kids can now print out all sorts of things that we couldn't engineer in the past. I that That's a good question. I have not seen any of that technology, at least at the regionals. I don't know what happens at the at ICEF yet. So that's why I'm supposed to be going to ICEF starting next year. So right now, nothing like that has, has occurred. But there are middle schools that have 3D printers, so kids can actually build these things. So that that's an interesting question. I'm not sure what the answer to that is. It's, it's a brave new world that is evolving faster than we quite know how to handle it. Yeah, I mean, right now I think a lot of, I mean, unfortunately at the elementary and middle school level, a lot of the technology is using Google to do my science fair project and coming up with a, something I can find on the web. But well, what they should be using is Wolfram Alpha. Oh, okay. But <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're hitting the end of half an hour. I don't know quite where the time went. Um, as we round things up, for those of you who joined us partway through the broadcast, this has been a learning space. We are a, a collaboration out of Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, uh, out of the CosmoQuest.org uh, virtual research facility. I'm Dr. Pamela Gay. My co-host, as always, is George. Georgia Bracey, and this week we've been joined by Dr. Larry Lebowski out of the Planetary Science Institute. Um, this show is made possible thanks to contributions on Patreon.com. Uh, thank you to everyone who makes this show possible. We will be hosting a special fireside chat, or at least I'll be there in Georgia if she can stick her head in, Will, but I'm not committing her time. Uh, I'll be hosting a fireside chat Friday afternoon. Uh, 
email will be going out to the patrons with a link uh, later today. So thank you all for joining us, especially considering how snowy and awful it is pretty much from the Mississippi eastward here in the United States. Stay warm, <laughs> stay safe. Um, and if you're in the American Southwest or Australia, stay cool. Uh, and thank you all, wherever you may be in the world, for joining us. And have a great morning, evening, afternoon, no matter what your day may bring. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everybody.